So the sermon today is entitled, Turn Your Problems into Possibilities. How do you view your circumstances? It determines the outcome. Do you view your problem as a negative or a positive thing? Do you see a lemon as only bitter juice or do you make sweet lemonade? Do you draw closer to God when there is a problem, or do you feel defeated? In Christ, we are learning to upgrade the way we view problems. Too often what happens is there's an issue that happens, there's a situation, and we try to handle negative people. We try to problem solve. We try to resolve the situation. And that's pretty much standard practice. We try to figure out how to solve the problem. And you know, our language reflects how we view problems. If something happens, do you say something like, great, that's all I need? Why? Because you're imagining right now, it's going to be hard. It's going to be tough. So you set out with this problem, and you're already tired. And you might say, when it rains, it pours. And you're already undoing yourself. You've already pretty much given up. Or you don't even tackle the situation. You procrastinate. You put it off. And you're tired before you begin. But what if we were to look at the problem not as a deficit, but look at the problem as a possibility. Changes the way we view things. Well, our circumstances are not the problem. The problem is our perception of the circumstances. When there's an unfavorable circumstance, generally, people see it as difficulties that they have to contain, difficulties that they have to overcome. But God sees circumstances not with difficulties, but with provisions that he has placed in each problem. In Judges chapter 6, we have the story of Gideon. And in Gideon's life, everything was a problem. The Midianites had come in. They had destroyed the crops. They killed the animals. And Gideon is hiding in the wine press, bringing in the food that, to hide it from the Midianites so that they can't find it and take it away. And he's hiding down there. And the Lord comes up and he says, Hail, favored one. <laughs> You are a valiant man. You are a man of valor. And Gideon is like, me? Are you kidding? I don't know anything about that. And God says, I know. Gideon is like, I'm the poorest. My tribe is the poorest in all of Israel. And God says, I know. And Gideon is like, I don't know anything about how to handle anything. I'm so weak. And God says, I know. You're perfect. <laughs> Did you know that in the story of Gideon, the Lord gives Gideon a promise. You are a man of valor. He says it four times. You are a man of valor. You shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? I shall be with you, and you shall smite the Midianites as one man. And the last time, God did it through someone else. And each time God had given him this promise, Gideon would obey the Lord and what to do next, and each time that promise became more involved in his heart and he began to become that man of valor. And the last time 
that this promise came to Gideon, God told Gideon right on the night of the battle, I want you to go down into the camp of the Midianites at night. And Gideon was like, okay. So he went down there and he hears two men talking. One Midianite says, I had a dream last night. I dreamed that a loaf of barley bread came tumbling down the hill and it hit the tent and the tent overturned and laid it flat. And the other man said, well, this can be nothing else but the sword of Gideon. He's the man of Israel and we're going to lose. And Gideon heard that and that was the last little bit of that he needed to get into his heart where he rose up and he was confident. He knew he was a man of valor. God's promise creates encounter with God and his word. And we get to engage with God with the promise and not with the problem. God's perception is your solution. Romans 12, verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Ephesians 4, 23. And be constantly renewed in the spirit of your mind, having a fresh mental and spiritual attitude. Gideon was renewed in the spirit of his mind. So we look at life from the perspective of our promises and not our problems. So we don't focus on the problem. Instead, we use the problem to find the promise that is also present. You have a problem. And you think, okay, that's the problem. What's the opposite of the problem? That is your promise. And your promise then leads to God's provision. So let's say that the problem is anxiety. The opposite of anxiety is peace. So your provision is you get to encounter Jesus as the Prince of Peace. Every problem is a, has a signpost pointing to the opposite. If a person is fearful, the opposite of fear is perfect love. So the provision is God's perfect love casts out fear. God is not going to work on a person's fear. He's going to teach you how to be wonderfully loved. What you focus on is what you empower. We focus on the promise and not the problem. We focus on peace, not on anxiety. We focus on the opposite because the opposite belongs to you. Everything else, all the negative stuff, belongs to Jesus. Jesus died. When he died, you died. Nailed to that cross is stress, anxiety, fear, anger, all of those things that would try to come upon you. Those things Jesus paid the price for. Those belong to him. Love, joy, peace belong to you. So if you're stressed, you're being illegal. Oh, Jesus, I know you died for my anxiety, but I like it. I think I'll take it back. No, that's illegal behavior in the kingdom. So we rely on God's promises to turn your problems into possibilities. Through faith and patience, we inherit the promises. Hebrews 6.12 
Hebrews 10.36 For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Mark 9.23 All things are possible to them that believe. Have you noticed that when you read in the scriptures that Jesus never came talking about problems? He always talked about possibilities. After he had been preaching to the 5,000, they were hungry. The problem is there was no food to feed them with. But there was a boy who had lunch. There's some food. So the opposite of no food is food. There's the food. Jesus took the food and he lifted it up and he's blessed it. And then the provision came. Jesus always talked about possibilities. Peter came to him and said, this guy was talking about taxes. And Jesus said, go fishing. The first fish you find will have a gold coin in its mouth. Go and pay your taxes and mine. Jesus had no problems. He only had possibilities. Jesus was in the world where everything is viewed as a problem. But in the kingdom, everything is a possibility. All things are possible. Jesus gave us kingdom language and kingdom thinking so we can turn a problem into a possibility and then we talk to God about that. So, this is what I want to really communicate to you. When there's a problem, that problem seems to loom very, very large. In some cases, it's all you can think about. There's the problem. It's a problem. And it just seems to bombard your mind. I've got a problem. Then what happens is we take that problem and we turn to God and we say, God, look at this problem. And we start to talk to God about the problem. We tell him, this is what this person's doing. This is what this person's not doing. This is what's happening. This is what I don't like. This is a problem. God help me. God help me with my problem. This is a problem. But that's not how God sees the situation. God doesn't see the problems. God sees the provision that he has already placed in the problem. So he wants us to not take the problem to God, to him. No. Instead, he's like, don't talk to me about a problem when I'm trying to talk to you about possibilities. Listen to me. One way we could pray would be, Father, this has happened. How do you see it? What's the possibility here? I know the possibility has got to be bigger than the problem. Help me to see how you see it, God. What's the possibility here? That's how we pray. That is the perspective that God wants us to have. So don't pray the problem. Ask God, what's the possibility here? That's what we pray for. So you overcome difficulties by walking in the fruit of the Spirit. A problem is a vehicle to grow in your relationship with God. We get to partner with God with the promise and resolve the problem. Let me say that again. A problem is a vehicle by which we get to grow in our relationship with God. In this way, negative circumstances, difficulties, and problems are meant to continue your walk in the fruit of the Spirit. It helps you to grow and develop in the fruit of the Spirit. 
As you go through trials and temptations, you are growing in trust and reliance on the Lord. So here's the negative circumstances. Here's the difficulties that you face. And instead of seeing it as a problem, it's like, oh, wow, God, look at this. I get to grow in faith. I get to exercise my authority here. I'm being upgraded in my understanding of who I am as a child of God. I get to walk in blessings and favor. I get to grow in the fruit of the Spirit in each of these situations. That's a much better way to view your negative circumstances than to be all tired and defeated and overwhelmed by the problem. We turn doubt and unbelief into faith. When the Hebrews were in Egypt as slaves, they received a promise from God, a promise of deliverance, and that they were going to enter into the promised land. They saw the miracles that Moses was doing. They left with the wealth of Egypt, and they were rejoicing when they crossed the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army was destroyed. We still celebrate that today. It was so amazing. But when the Hebrews then got into the wilderness, what happened? They took their eyes off the promise and onto their landscape, the environment. They looked at all around them and they, they faced, a, where's the water going to come from? Oh no. They took their focus off the promise that God would take them out of Egypt and into the land of milk and honey. They entered into doubt, and doubt led to unbelief, and unbelief turned into betrayal. They wanted to go back. A promise shows you the outcome. The outcome is designed to increase your faith so that you engage with the process. Okay? A promise shows you the outcome. I've been healed by the stripes of Jesus. What's the outcome? I've been healed. The outcome is designed to increase your faith so that you engage with the process. A promise is a guaranteed outcome. You can be super confident that what God has promised, he is well able to perform. It's like being on a Super Bowl team. You know you're going to win even before you play the game. But you still have to get in there and play the game. But you play the game with a smile on your face because you know you're going to win. That's what it's like. You still have to play the game. You still have to go through these circumstances. Hebrews 10.23 so let us seize and hold fast and retain without wavering the hope we cherish and confess and our acknowledgement of it. For he who promised is reliable, sure, and faithful to his word. Psalm 56, 4. By the help of God, I will praise his word. On God, I lean, rely, and confidently put my trust. I will not fear. The Father loves impossibilities. He loves stepping into our insecurities and inadequacies and showing himself strong on our behalf. God loves to be our deliverer, to be our hero. Your God-given promise is an antidote to overcome all problems. So here's a problem. Thank God I've got a promise. Why am I panicking? I've got a promise. Why am I upset? I've got a promise. 
I've got a promise. I've got a prophecy. I've got a verse of scripture the Holy Spirit gave me six months ago. I'm set. I'm going to win. Yes. However God gives you that promise, that is your outcome. So when you're reading the scriptures and something seems to kind of stand out to you and it really touches you, that's a promise from God. The scripture is full of promises. Sometimes people receive that promise, prophecy. But God always has a promise because he's put the provision inside the problem. And it's like a treasure hunt. You're looking for it. You find the promise associated with that problem. And you have the guaranteed outcome. Jesus said, with people it's impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. Everything in your life has the opportunity for you to be upgraded, increased, receive fullness, receive abundance. It's the possibility for you to overcome, to rise up, to occupy a new place. Look at that problem. I'm so excited. Lord, we get to work on this together. I have got a promise from you. And now look, you're going to be so amazing. I can't wait to see what you're going to do. So before I was talking about how when there's a problem, the problem is so big that you can't seem to think about anything else. Well, when you have that promise from God, you get that promise and you speak it out. You put it on paper and you put it on the door. You put it on the bathroom mirror. Put it on the refrigerator. Put it on the door before you walk out of the house. Get that promise in front of you all the time. For the mind that is set on the spirit is life and peace. And when you get that promise and you get it into your heart and into your mind, it really takes hold and it takes root in you. And then you're able then to have that faith and confidence. Don't just have a verse. No, get that scripture, get that promise into your heart. Make sure it's in there because that's what's going to make the promise so much bigger than the problem. Get that promise get that opposite of the problem inside of you so that you know that you know and then you will have that faith we have the promises I've been healed by the stripes of Jesus that's a good promise I shall not die but I will live to declare the works of the Lord I prosper and I am in health even as my soul prospers. I have the mind of Christ. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I have been made rich by the poverty of Jesus. It is God who gives me wealth to get power or power to get wealth. can go either way. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Those are just some examples of the promises of God that are in the scripture. Get it into your heart till it's so big that that problem now gets dwarfed and it seems insignificant in light of what God has promised for you. Six, utilize the greatness of God that is already inside of you because everything is possible if you believe. So we use the problem. Don't be used by it. Suppose you're at a company that's struggling because sales are down. So you go in early 
and you pray. This company is blessed because I'm here. Because I'm here. So you go through every room. You lay hands on the desks. You lay hands on all of the equipment. You lay hands on the doors, on the walls. You bless the company. Lord, let the blessings come. Increase our orders. Increase our sales. And you pray throughout that company. And the company is blessed because you're there. And you are praying. There was a story of this man. And he was having some trouble with cash flow. So he went to his friend and told him the problem. And the guy said, you know, if God isn't bringing the money into you, then maybe it's because God is going to give you an idea to make money. The guy said, well, that sounds like God. Yeah. So he went off and he prayed, asking the Lord, God, what is it that you would have me do? The Lord said, I want you to start a business fixing office machines, like photocopiers and printers and things like that. The man said, the Lord, I don't know anything about fixing photocopiers or anything like that. And the Lord said, I do. So the man started this business and he printed up all kinds of leaflets and passed them all over town and he posted his thing on the website and he has his business and finally he got a, his first call. And he goes, okay, where are you located? I'll be there in five minutes. So he goes over there with his toolbox. But there's no tools in his toolbox. All he has in his toolbox is a 3 by 5 card with God's promise on it. Okay. So he goes, what's the problem? The photocopier's not working. Okay. Uh, please step outside. Thank you. <laughs> so he goes to the photocopier and he lays hands on it. And he prays over it. Jo, 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 jo. Comes back to life. You can come in now. It's all fixed. Really? Wow, you're so fast. Yeah, yeah. Does it need any parts or do I have to order parts? Oh, no, no. Well, how do you do it so fast? Well, I, I just kind of, you know, I just massaged a few things. You know, it, but it's working now. It's like, wow, thank you. So this guy gets a reputation all over town. And not only in that town, but the surrounding towns. This guy is quick, and he's so effective, and you never have to order any parts. He made a ton of money. He was the best in the business. So all of your circumstances really are about you being empowered to see God, to know God, to flow with God, and to be amazed at what he does. The more difficult the circumstances, the more the sense of wonder when God does something amazing. So stay engaged with God's promise and believe because all things are possible to him that believes. Praise God. Deborah, what a wonderful message, full of encouragement. I like that. You know, I'm reminded that the uh, Chinese word for crisis and opportunity is the same word. I think it's very important to realize that, you know, the greatest things in life come because people are overcoming challenges. If you've got to overcome your challenges. I think it's a fantastic, the best way to do it, and you bless the world with it. Um, I've said this in the public before that. In the natural, losing my money was a bad thing, but in reality, it was the best thing that happened when I lost all my money because that's when I came to God and really started serving Him. So I have to agree with that 100%. So, wonderful message, Deborah. All right, praise the Lord. Let's start with communion, please. 
As everybody do a USP, follow me, please. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm not aware of any sins. In the name of Jesus, thank you for cleansing me of all unrighteousness. According to 1 John 1, 9. Okay, Holy Communion. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to receive this Holy Communion. We remember that the Lord Jesus, on the same night, when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this remembrance of me. So, repeat after me. Thank you, Lord, for the miracle that raised Jesus from the dead, which also healed all of his wounds and made his whole body whole, restoring him to complete health in a resurrected, glorious, perfect, resurrected body. As each of us partake of your body, Jesus, we thank you, Lord, that according to Jeremiah 30, 17, and 1 Peter 2, 24, we declare that you have restored to us health and have healed our wounds by the stripes of Jesus. We also thank you for making us whole with nothing missing and nothing lacking. We do this in remembrance of you. Amen. In addition, in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in a worthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Let man examine himself, so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So repeat after me, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, God, for your blood that was shed for us. We also thank you, Lord, that according to 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus has cleansed us from every sin. Holy Spirit, you dwell inside me, the believer. And you quicken our mortal body and restore it to the life of God. Healed, healthy, whole, restored, rejuvenated, and perfected. Amen. We take this now in remembrance of you, Jesus. Okay, let's do 20 affirmations of 1 Peter 2.24. Everybody ready? We heal by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. One more. We have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. Praise the Lord. 